now we move on to our next speaker, Peter Lisson. Uh, Peter is a principal consultant at Orchestrated Knowledge. Uh, he has uh, 45 years of professional experience. He is focused on culture management, process improvement, teamwork and communication and metrics. Uh, some uh, topics that we really need in any company, any organization that uh, wants to go through this uh, period, especially now. And his title of the presentation is From Room to Zoom. Quite catchy. Hi, Peter. It was Hello. Be connected with you. Hello. It's nice that the previous speaker finished talking about culture when that is what I normally talk about, yeah, but not a... today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where are you based now? Where I am based. I am based in England. So uh, wherever you are, just want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. <laughs> um, I expect people around the world to be listening. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, you have the floor, and you can uh, also share the screen. Thank you. Uh, my screen is shared. People can see it. We can see it. Yeah. Good, 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 good. So um, what I would like to talk to you about today is uh, the idea from Room to Zoom. We have, over the past two months, a lot has changed in the world. And that means that a lot of ways of communicating and changing things have happened. Um, some people believe they can just move over and transfer their presentations online and it's going to work. I want to talk a few minutes about why this is not going to work and why it is important. So moving from face to face to a Zoom type environment is a challenge and I will give you the reason straight away, e-learning does not work. So that's my number one challenge for you. And there are good reasons for this. There are various statistics about e-learning that are worthwhile looking into. Um, on average, employees get 4.8 minutes per day for e-learning and self-training and online activities. Between 4 and 10%, depending on which statistics you're looking at, of the students ever complete the training they start. And social learning, meaning when you are in a classroom, is estimated to be 75% more effective than e-learning. I'd be happy to share this presentation afterwards uh, if you can click on the links and see the statistics that I used for this. The reason that e-learning doesn't work is largely because of the lack of social or peer support. You're all alone. If you don't understand something, you cannot turn to your neighbor to ask if they understood it. While you are working or while you are attending a, a seminar or a workshop or um, a webinar online, you're going to um, have a quick look at Facebook, read your emails, do all kinds of things. Things you're going to continuously get interrupted. And you cannot, first, you cannot express your expectations properly to the instructor. You cannot interrupt the instructor to say something or to ask a question or to ask them to go faster or slower. And at the same time, the instructor cannot see you, so does not know if you are paying attention, if you look bored, if you looked confused. So all this is creating a problem. And of course, online training is very often very theoretical. It's difficult to organize exercises and role plays when you're online. In class, that can happen. When I was a child, many, many years ago, um, we had a toy called Mechano. And Mechano were little metal pieces that you had to screw together and it was very tiny and it required patience and it took time to build. Nobody, no child today uses Mechano because we've got Lego. Click it together and it's done. Okay, we have lost 
the ability to concentrate over long periods of time, we have lost the ability to maintain interest. So what I want to talk about is how to design your presentations to make something that people want. And I'm going to remain very superficial because I don't know what kind of presentation or communication you would normally do. So first aspect is the quality aspect. If you're going to produce quality and you need to produce quality, if you're going to survive in this, you need to understand why your service will work or will not work. And that means understanding some of the basic principles of learning. When you are talking to people online, you are trying to get communication across. There are a number of different aspects of this. And people react differently to different things. So you need to try to combine them. So the cognitive aspect, the Gestalt theory, is that you learn best when you are adding a bit of knowledge to something you already know. If you have no understanding of the, the subject to start with, you're in trouble. But if we can just stretch you a little bit, build on something you know, then slowly we can increase your understanding. The difference between cracking an egg and baking a cake. You have to consider that people have got multiple intelligences. Um, we talk about IQ and EQ and other things. There's loads of intelligence and you need to maintain a balance. Okay, some people like the logic and the mathematical aspect. Some people need to move. Um, you need to be interpersonal, you need to be able to communicate, you need to feel that you can relate to this person. The environment is critical. I very strongly recommend uh, Stephen Heppel's film about the environment in a work area. But it is, everything impacts your learning ability. It, how much light you have, the uh, level of CO2 in the area, the heating, all these things play together. The social cues, seeing your colleagues doing it, you have to do all this at the same time in order to achieve a result that will satisfy your students, your listeners. Kinesthetic learning. You want to learn by doing things. You have to build in exercises. You've got to build in responses. You've got to try to get it. Again, in a classroom, you can do role plays. When you're online, it's more difficult. But consider the different options. Hands-on learning, emotional experience, doodling. I cannot sit through a class and listen and learn anything if I don't have a pen and paper. I need the pencil and paper. I might be taking notes that I'll never read again. I might be doodling, but I need that in order to proceed. So once you understand those different aspects, you can start designing the course. I'm not going to talk about the context, who you are teaching. I'm not going to talk about the message because that's going to be different for anybody who needs to communicate anything. I would like to talk about the content and just draw your attention to this mind map here. The mind map that's in the corner, which you cannot read, is actually the structure of what I'm busy talking about. This is how it started. So when you design the content of your course, you need to design the content so that it can be understood. Okay, Don't blame people for not listening. If they are not listening, if they don't hear what you're saying, you are not communicating. So you need to make sure that the people you are speaking to can understand what you are talking about. You need to pay attention to the attention span. In a classroom, I can maintain your attention for 20 minutes without any effort. Online, it's seven minutes. After that, I need to change rhythm. I need to change subject. I need to change methodology. I need to change voice. I need to change something so that you will 
get your interest back there. Whatever it is, be prepared to change your voice tone, the way you deliver things, or the methodology you're using. This is a picture of me teaching in a classroom. And you will notice that I am speaking. I am using illustrations. Just a quick reminder that PowerPoint is there to illustrate what you are saying. It is not there for you to read. It is there to add to it. I've got people taking notes. You have to take notes. You have to understand it. I have got posters, flip charts, whiteboards, things that I want people to maintain in their mind for a while while I talk about something else. I can highlight aspects of what I am speaking. So I can highlight a certain portion of the presentation. I can highlight it in the way I deliver it. And this is the same classroom seen from the other side. I will organize activities, put it into practice, get people to do this. So how do you get to do this all online? That's the challenge. We need to use graphics. Okay, Graphics lightens up the information and clarifies it. You need to use some statistics and data. But if you're using statistics and data, make sure that you say where they come from. Uh, make it simple, make it a simple graph, unless you're addressing uh, economists or finance statistical experts. Just make it very simple to understand and clear. I know that you can always add more to your statistics. You can use text from time to time. If you are going to use a slide with a lot of text, bear in mind that they are going to be reading it and not listening to you. This slide might look exaggerated. I just want to show you two real life examples of courses I have been to where there were slides overwhelmed with text so that you had to choose, do I try to read this or do I continue listening? Animation. What a wonderful idea. Let's put something different in, surprise them. I don't think I shared the sound there, but there was music to that as well. But I forgot to click on the share si sound. Um, animation always brings back the attention. Plan the presentation of your course. Okay, Put in some variety. You want some theory. You want some humor. You want some practical examples. You want some anecdotes, things that have happened to you. You need to build up your credibility. I am a person who has done this. I have studied my topic. I know what I'm talking about. I have experience. I have a past. A warning about culture. There are some very different things you need to understand, especially if you're doing this online and you don't know who is listening to you. The whole world might be listening to you. Humor is a fantastic tool. It is also incredibly dangerous. Every culture thinks of different things to laugh at. What you find funny might be offensive to another person. Bear that in mind. Handle with care. Humor is a dangerous tool. There's an easy subject to laugh about, and that's yourself. Make fun of yourself. That always works. Consider that different cultures, because of different education systems, have different ways of learning and different focuses on interest. So uh, the culture map here by Erin Meyer is very good at explaining this. And I'll give you just one example. Persuading people. If you're talking to people who come from Italy or France, they want to know the theories. They want to know 
which philosopher, which academician, who, who invented this thing? And then you can work down into how it applies in this context. If you are talking to US, Australian people, then you need to first give the practical example and back it up with the theories afterwards. So understand that probably if you're online, half your audience will disagree with the way you're doing it. You need to try and swing back and forth. Next, I'm going to talk about composing your course. I'm going to suggest you compose your presentation, your course, your webinar, like a meal. So it's a nice three course meal. We're going to have a starter. We're going to have a main course. We're going to have a dessert. We're going to have some spices with it and I'm going to taste it before serving it. So the appetizer starters open their appetite. Give the people something that makes them want to listen to you. You need them to relax into what you want to say. So talk to them. Um, why are you here? Why should you listen to me? What's your problem? What's the potential that I am offering? Why should you pay attention? I normally do this interactively when I'm in, even now online, I do it interactively. So there's a whiteboard here from what one of my courses where I was just capturing expectations and needs of the audience before starting. The main course is the big bit, okay? So you want to include everything in here. You want to include protein, make it personal, give your anecdotes, some carbohydrates, make it practical, some vegetables, don't forget to include some theory. All this has to work and it has to be appetizing. They often say that a meal is eaten first with the eyes. The same is true of your presentation. If you have a boring presentation, if you are planning on a death by PowerPoint with lots of words, people will not be listening to you. Finish off with your dessert. Draw your conclusions. What are the key messages? Thank you and feedback. Feedback is a difficult aspect. Um, so this chart here is feedback after one of my courses that I requested. So I asked people to tell me what was their reaction. Like every good meal, you want people to end up wanting more. You don't want to get fed up with everything you've given them. You don't want to give them indigestion. Before you deliver, you want to make sure that it tastes correctly. You want to make sure that it works. So start off checking your contents. Have you got consistent spelling? Have you got colors and fonts that are consistent throughout the whole presentation? Have you decided whether to capitalize bullet points, whether to punctuate them or not? How does it work? When you transition from one concept to another, do the slides follow? Do the ideas follow? Does it work together? And just because I've put up English and American spelling, I just want to point out that um, there's a number of varieties here. I tend to use the Oxford English Dictionary spelling, which contains some words spelled the American way, some words spelled in what people believe is the English way. So I tend to try to use that one to please everybody and to make everyone unhappy. And then decide, are you ready? Can you deliver this? Review, revise, rehearse again and again. Time yourself, record yourself, watch the recording. Make sure you know what it is ready. Make sure that you are ready for the technical failure that will come and spoil your whole presentation. Can you continue speaking after your technical failure? Do you think it is going to work? Do you have enough backup material in your mind to continue? I had to continue speaking 
giving a workshop for about one hour during a complete power failure. So I could not use any of the equipment I had. We didn't have lights in the room, so people could not take notes and so on. I had to just continue talking and make it interesting. It can be done. If you have got references, if you are using pictures, if you are using quotes, make sure that they are there. So every one of my slides, when I've used a picture taken from somewhere, I have included the source in a link on the bottom of the slide. And then finally, you have to sell it. Marketing aspect, um, think about what you want to actually sell. So first of all, the thing that's going to attract people is a title. Choose a good title. Um, choose a title that will intrigue people, that will make them want to come and hear you. Which one would you go and listen to? Implementing proactive quality assurance or the quality auditor is an obstacle to product quality. I use the second one because it's more exciting. In fact, here are some of the titles I have used in previous talks. Um, get something that's going to attract people, that's going to make them curious as to what the heck it is you're talking about. Write your pitch. You're going to have to give a sales pitch to the organizers of the conference, to the students online, to whoever it is. Start with that. Write down what you're going to talk, what are the benefits they're going to get out of it, and then build a course that matches your synopsis. Listen to feedback. There are only two kinds of feedback. There is positive feedback, which is nice and comforting and useless. And there is constructive feedback in which you are being told what you did wrong and how you can improve it next back, next time around. Listen to it, use it. Feedback is incredibly important. And then we finally come to the final step, which is the delivery. Never read the slides. Remember that your slides are there to illustrate what you are saying. If you are reading the slides, one of you is useless. Measure your speed of delivery. Understand that people do not necessarily speak the same language, might need more time to process what you're saying. Be alive. I recently followed a course which totaled about six hours of a film of a woman standing without moving next to a slide and telling us what was on the slide. I got through it because I wanted the certificate, but boy, was I bored. Question and answers. This is the scary bit. This is the scary bit, which I'm about to get to now again, where somebody is going to ask a question I've never thought of, and I have got some iconoclast who is going to try to publicly demolish everything I have just said and prove me wrong. That's fine. Be prepared for this. It's going to happen. So, in conclusion, Structure your presentation, know your audience. Include theory and practice. Know your topic and your messages better than you expect. Delivering it online is a lot more difficult than doing it in a classroom. Make sure people have fun and want some more. Don't make empty commitments. And that's it from me. So um, thank you. You can uh, reach me at these different areas. My, um, if you want to talk more, you can go in Calendly and book a uh, talk. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I'll quickly plug my books. There we are. Uh, um, probably shouldn't be doing that, but okay. Um, just one note, my Email right now that was on the slides does not appear to be working. So if you want to email me, can you please use the orchestratedknowledge at gmail.com email, 
rather than the others. So thank you, and I will hand back to our moderator. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm here. So thanks a lot, Peter. Thank uh, you. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate your presentation, and uh, I deliver also workshops from time to time, so I'm learning uh, new things every day about that. Uh, also, we have a couple of participants who asked for your presentation to be shared uh, later on. Uh, uh, would that yes. be available for them? Yes, absolutely. So can you, I, I will I will put it online, certainly. Um, I just flick this back up. So I've got the address here, email address, orchestratedknowledge at gmail.com. If you send me an email, I will send you a copy of the uh, presentation. I have no problem yeah. with that. I will give you the link to where to find it. And uh, we can take one question from the audience um, coming from uh, Mircea Rudzinski. How can we learn smart in these days with a lot of information, uh, which is not necessarily good? I mean, we're kind of lost in the, all the types of information, courses, uh, videos, or so on, books, and we kind of have to filter uh, something which is very useful and most fit for our needs. Uh, do you have some advice, clues about how to do that, how to select the right material? Um, don't select the right material. Take as much material as you can. Take material that contradicts what you thought you knew. Find out the opposite concepts of what you believe. Read people who disagree with you or that you disagree with. And slowly, as you accumulate more and more information, reality will filter through you will start to see this doesn't work in reality. These are in contradiction. Um, one of the traditional examples is the uh, self-help book, okay? I've got shelves full here of books of wonderful methodologies and tools that will help you. They won't. They won't because if you read it carefully, you realize that this book has been written based on the experience of two companies that are very different to yours. They've got good ideas. They did work, but you've got a different culture. You've got a different product. You've got a different way of doing things. So therefore, they probably will not work for you. But go for it. Learn as much as you can, accept that people disagree with you, and slowly you'll find out what, what works, what is true. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Glad to have you here. And uh, well, there are a couple of more questions in the chat, but we're out of time and we need to move on to the panel uh, section. Innovation Days 2020 is part of the Future Skills lifelong learning program. The project is co-financed from the European Social Fund through the Human Capital Operational Program 2014-2020.